Gavin Gay here from UltimateReloader.com. I'm here at the 2024 SHOT Show with Brian Litz from Applied Ballistics. We're here to talk about the rimfire research that you've been doing. This is some pretty interesting stuff. Yeah, yeah, I'm learning a lot about rimfire. And uh, honestly, it's stuff that I've wanted to look into for a long time because I hear things about rimfire shooting that is different from center fire. You know, some of the sensitivities and finickiness of 22 rimfire, especially when you get out to longer range, which is something that a lot more shooters are doing with 22s. You know, 50 meters, 100 yards, that kind of 22 shooting, I think is pretty well solved. Like there's not as there's not as many problems you can have in that distance, but you start trying to hit targets at 200, 300, 400 yards with 22. Yeah. Now you're into a whole new realm that it wasn't even really made for. Like mm -hmm. 20, it's not made for that kind of distance. And so the problems that you have over the, those distances are kind of new to a lot of people because we're doing it for the first time. Yeah. And because it, it has now become a long range thing and there's questions about the ballistics, it's like, I'm up. <laughs> right. It's, that's me. So And it's something new, right? It's not what you've yeah. typically focused on in the past. Right. And there's a lot of differences between supersonic and, and subsonic aerodynamics, you know, like stability for one. For supersonic centerfire rifles, we've got the Miller stability formula, you know. Your SG should be above one and a half, and that's it, and it's good. But there isn't a there isn't a formula for subsonic that hmm. characterizes your stability. Interesting. And partly because your stability is characterized more by the dynamic stability in subsonic than it is the static stability of supersonic. So those are all of that to say it's kind of uncharted territory. Right. And some of the things that I'm trying to chart have to do with stability, have to do with predicting trajectories. So like you know, why is it that in a ballistic solve rate it'll match every 50 yards out to maybe 200 and then after that you start getting separation. Okay, thank you for that. Mm -hmm. Because with center fire, it's so easy to run a solver and get predictable results. But with rim fire, I'm doing a lot of drop tests yep. at yardage intervals like the ones that you're describing because I'm not, I'm not getting what I expect. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was <laughs> just talking about this downstairs with somebody and, and after looking closely at it, it's uh, the problem is that if you use a ballistic coefficient to characterize your 22 rimfire rounds, all right, I don't care if it's G1 or G7, both of them are poor matches to the actual subsonic drag model of that bullet, according to what we're measuring with Doppler radar. Okay. So I think the solve for this, the fix, is either going to be to have like well-established Doppler radar profiles for every rimfire type, which isn't hard to do, or and or a different standard to reference the ballistic coefficient to, one that truly does represent 22 rimfire. So yeah. if we go back to those G1 and G7 projectiles, the G1 is kind of a flat base, old school looking design, right? And then the G7 is a boat tail, is that correct? Mm -hmm. Yep. And then your your 22 caliber rimfire projectile looks totally different. Is that is that a part of the thing here, is to try and yeah, the geometrically characterize the shape at all, or is it more the behavior? It's more the behavior because okay. the, the shape of a 22 bullet is a lot like a G1. Okay. So like, I had thought for a long time that the G1 standard would be a good representation of 22s. But now, we, you know, with the more Doppler radar shooting that we do and the more problems that we see, it's like, eh, neither of those BC standards are really good for this. The closest one is one called RA4. Hmm. It's a drag model that is for like air rifle, you know, slugs, pellets and 22s. That's the closest one I've seen, but it's still not for a ring fire bullet. Like the Doppler radar tracks are different from the RA4. So we might need a different BC standard for them. Um, but the other problem, even if we clean that part up, is, is the dynamic stability aspect of it. Like you said, when you shoot center fire, everything's so well behaved and predictable. Yeah. In center fire, that bullet's coming out at multiple the speed of sound really fast and it hits the air and it's it's decelerating it at over 40 g's okay are you serious wow 40 g's just from the air pushing backwards huh yep yeah wow and so with that much aerodynamic force on the bullet its axis aligns with its direction of of travel it snaps into it perfect so you hardly huh. get any like a fraction of a degree of pitching and yawing because the bullet is so stable at that speed you slow down to like subsonic velocities and the air is a lot more squishy. You know, the bullet can pitch and yaw a lot more before it's weather veined into shape. 
you know, gotcha. just think of a weather vane in fact like when the wind is slow speed the thing kind of is lazy to point into mm -hmm. the wind mm -hmm. the faster the wind goes the more it straightens out and like yeah goes right in gotcha similar thing with with low speed aerodynamics the forces aren't as great and so the stability is different hmm. and you can get a lot of variation in how much yaw you have so those are things that we're looking at to improve the predictability of rim fire trajectories it's a lot of radar work it's a lot of testing in different DA environments so that we can see what the stability condition is sensitive to. Um, but at the end of it, I think we're going to have a, a much improved solution for rim fire trajectories at long range. So I have a question for you about all this. Mm -hmm. When you have an application that you are researching that's related to military applications, etc., I imagine there's a lot more resources and backing and motivation. Yeah. For this rimfire study, is is this for your NRL 22 shooter, your uh, rimfire ammunition manufacturer? Like, what? Wh how do you justify that work, and who benefits the most? Um, I don't worry most about that. <laughs> I just do science, and okay. in this in this particular case of the 22 rimfire stuff, it's typical blue sky research. Like, we don't know. I don't know. I don't know if the information is going to end up being useful to ammo makers. All of those people you said potentially yeah. could benefit from what's learned, but I didn't start this out saying, I need to find out how to make Lapua Rimfire ammo better. Okay. It, it wasn't that. It, in fact, one of the first things that started me on this road was a discovery that I made about Lapua's high velocity rimfire, actually the SK long range before that. It's a little bit higher velocity. So what happens when you have a little higher velocity rimfire ammo, a uh, couple things happen your muzzle velocity in relation to the speed of sound, okay? Mm -hmm. There's a very sharp drag rise at the speed of sound, the sound mm -hmm. barrier, you know? Mm -hmm. If you're Chuck Yeager, that's the thing you're trying to fly fast enough to go through. Uh, it's yeah. really bumpy. But if you're a 22 bullet and your muzzle velocity is at the sound barrier, your drag is so incredibly high right at that moment that it slows the bullet down really fast to a subsonic speed that it then kind of coasts on. Okay. Yeah. Now, imagine you're shooting a string of 10 shots, okay? Mm -hmm. And the average is right at the speed of sound, half the shots are above and half are below. So, and imagine your spread in velocity would have been 40 feet per second, okay? Now, imagine that the faster half of those shots all got the brakes put on immediately as they came out of the barrel and immediately lost 10 feet per second, 20 okay. feet per second. Now, what do you have? You have those 10 rounds going down range, not with 40 feet per second of extreme spread, but after they've traveled 20, 30 yards, it's not 40 feet per second. You're down to maybe 20 feet per second of extreme spread. Interesting. Because those fast shots got trimmed. We call this mock trimming. Okay. Hmm. And that's a name for what you get when your average velocity is the speed of sound, the faster shots are trimmed, and the slower shots are not affected. Right. And so now to make this work, there's a lot of caveats with this. To make that work, you have to understand the temperature effects on not just your muzzle velocity of your ammo, because that can move your average. Sure. Temperature also moves the speed of sound. Right. So you've got this ballet that you've got to dance <laughs> to make it work just right so that your average velocity is right at the speed of sound for this temperature. It's it's difficult to manage, but if you, if you can do it, you enjoy the benefit of basically half of the vertical dispersion at long range because your bullets are flying most of the way with half the velocity spread. Interesting. So the spread in time of flight is cut in half, and that's your vertical. Hmm. Now, the downside of mock trimming is that in order to do it, like I'm saying, you've got to be right at that drag rise. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, windage is most sensitive to high drag. So this having a transonic muzzle velocity is good for mock trimming and is good for your vertical at long range, but unfortunately, it's bad for your wind deflection. Interesting. Your wind deflection will be minimized if you stay subsonic from the muzzle all the way, where drag is kind of low. You're not encountering the drag rise or any of that. Okay. So that's where your wind will be minimized, but your vertical will be minimized if you go a little bit faster. It's kind of weird, but it's a good thing to understand because, you know, guys, it's part of the mystery, you know. Guys go out some days and they're like, you won't believe how many shots I put on a 300 yard target with a 22. It was like a one minute of angle vertical. It's like they're going on and on. So you're like, I got to come see this. So you go out the next day and they're all over the place, <laughs> right? That Different. 22 has embarrassed a lot of people that right, way right. because it's not repeatable. Well, 
there had never really been an explanation for that. Mm -hmm. And I think that mock trimming and the nuanced uh, effects of, of temperature on mm -hmm. your speed of sound and on your muzzle velocity, and it's just this, when they line up, you get amazing results. When they don't line up, it's back to normal, mm -hmm. business as usual. So that, that's one discovery that I, I've got a paper written on it, I'm polishing about to publish it. Okay. But depending on when you release this, it might be might beat the paper. Um, but the paper, of course, has all the technical background and plots and yep. for the science guys that want to know exactly how it's working. Um, and this same, the same thing works for anything subsonic. You can look at like 300 blackout. We've seen 300 blackout mock trim faster shots, pistol okay. rounds. Like, but at some point you get to where like, who cares about vertical at long range with a pistol, you know? Right. It's just at the speed that it could be happening, but no one really cares. Huh. And I guess another tactical consideration of this approach, if you're looking at 300 blackout is, if you're mock trimming, it means half your shots are above the speed of sound. Well, part of the reason for being subsonic a lot is to be quiet. Right. And if you're mock trimming, half of your shots are cracking, yeah. getting the supersonic crack and half yep. of them aren't. Typically, that's a sign guys take as a bad sign. Like, consistency's everything, and if half of my shots are making a noise and half of them aren't, guys think of that as a place they don't want to be. Right. But, but I think there's, um, there's a good benefit that can come out of that if you, if you use it right. Wow. Yeah, so that's mock trimming. Um, so between mock trimming and the trajectory prediction stuff, um, there's one more thing that I'm working on that explain, I'm attempting to explain the group convergence okay. that is seen with 22 sometimes. Now, I didn't warm up to this very, very easily because <laughs> as you know, we went through this with center fire. Yeah. This whole thing where guys are like, I shoot better groups at 300 than 100. Right. I tried to model that in my simulation, my six degree of freedom software. Nothing I did could model converging groups. It's like, ah, eh, that's just a model. Let's go see if we can do it. Right. So we went and built a shoot through target and started, you know, 100 to 300, screening the group at 100, printing at 300. We tried it all. We tried all the stuff. Nothing actually makes groups that converge. So that's kind of where we left it with center fire. But now I've got our own guys like Shane Barnhart at the Lapua Rimfire Test Facility yeah. with instrumented screens, 50 yards, 50 meters, and I think 100 meters or 100 yards. But screening the groups and he's like yeah sometimes they're just they're not physically smaller they're angularly smaller so like mm -hmm. if it's one minute at 50 if it's 0.7 minutes at 100 right it's a physically bigger group but angularly it converged makes sense and that's what we're looking for and i mean it, like, may, it might not make sense i understand what you're saying however. right yeah right you can you can if you envision like a corkscrew trajectory path that starts with a bigger corkscrew yeah. and then converges to a small one you can kind of see how your groups at shorter range would be bigger. And, uh, but I think with center fire, we never saw it. I fired up the six degree freedom model with rim fire. I built a, a model out of the data from Bob McCoy, did a report, I think in the 60s for the Olympic team characterizing mm. rim fire. So all this data is there, all of the arrow coefficients that you need to okay. drive a six degree freedom model, built the six degree freedom model and started like iterating on launch dynamics. like one of the inputs in a sixth off model is a pitch rate and a yaw rate at the muzzle, like at launch, or just a pitch angle and yaw angle. Mm -hmm. Point is you can, you can, with a high degree of control, model the launch dynamics of a thing and see how it dampens that out with distance. So I'm modeling these corkscrew flight paths and this time my six degree of freedom model actually is able to show converging groups. Now, the cause of it, like, the cause of it is my, in the, in the simulation, it, I arrived at it by tweaking the launch dynamic conditions until the model showed that effect. Now, what's that translate to in real life? Well, if you've got a rifle that's shooting converging groups, maybe you have a launch condition that's similar to the one that I'm modeling that's simulating converging groups. So that's what I'm looking at now wow. is like how a launch dynamic could set up an uh, opportunity for convergence. And convergence isn't always good. Like you think, oh, it was bigger at 50, it got smaller than 100, how's that not good? Well, maybe it didn't have to be bigger at 50 to begin with. Mm -hmm. you know, maybe mm -hmm. that would be better if it's just 0.5 all the way instead right. of going from one to 0.7. Right. So that's what I'm trying to learn with, with all of this rim fire stuff. And like I said, it's been quite a few years. It's been on the back burner. It hasn't been a high priority, but 
kind of done a lot of stuff now, you know, we've done a lot of projects, a lot of stuff has been resolved and completed, and with rimfire becoming more relevant for long range shooting, these questions are just out there, and they, it felt like the time was right to solve this problem, so that's what I've been working on. That's really interesting, and, and you know, for me, it, it does make me think, as the solvers get more sophisticated, and as the sensing of the environment gets more incorporated, we'll hopefully arrive at better predictions for for these rimfire applications. And you know, we shoot at our property usually out to about 400. We have a coyote target. That's kind of the acid test. You know, can we hit this guy? And uh, it's really difficult. And like like you mentioned, you know, might, you might get good success one day, and then things go haywire the next day. And this helps me to understand some of why that might be happening. Yeah, the solvers, modern ballistic solvers, really have been built around supersonic. You know, they're set up really well for it. There's not very much uncertainty in it, in terms of like what the solver's doing. Now, right. there can be uncertainty with the user on, you know, scope tracking. There's reasons the error creeps in, but the way the solver is solving is sort of optimized for supersonic. And it's the same basic approach for subsonic, but it's just not been as optimized yet. Gotcha. And now with Doppler radar, we can look at these things in flight and see like exactly what the shape of the drag curve is because it's so important with mm -hmm. this stuff, especially with the interplay between Mach number and speed of sound and Mach trimming. Like, temp and you know, another thing that temperature affects is the coating on the bullets. Mm. Um, so like the wax or oil will be more or less viscous if it's hotter or colder. That makes sense. And that condition in the barrel now matters. Right. So there's, that's, and that's not a thing that we have in center fire is that right. variable. Right. Another thing, <laughs> the shape of the bullet is not what you think it is. Like if you pull a 22 bullet, you'll see like there's a picture of one there where it's kind of fat in the middle mm -hmm. and it's rebated to fit in the case. Okay. Well, when you fire that thing and it's in the air, the back of the bullet, there's no visible rebate or boat tail or anything. The pressure behind the lead bullet doesn't have a jacket to keep it the same shape. So it obturates the bullet. Yeah. The yeah. soft lead just obturates yep. and fills the barrel. So when you see a bullet flying through the air like a high speed mm -hmm. camera, it's like a dome nose and like a straight cylindrical body. Mm -hmm. So you can't even like measure the bullet unfired and characterize its mass yeah. and aerodynamic properties and then make a model because the damn thing is different when it's flying. <laughs> right. So there's all of these kind of squishy disconnects with rimfire and subsonic uh, that have allowed this error to creep into right. the trajectory prediction stuff. So looking at wringing out the, that last bit of squishiness out of that yeah. so that we can like, hey, if it, people will be, then trust their solver more and mm -hmm not be so quick to change VCs or whatever, it'll just it'll just work, just like it does for, for supersonic. Yeah, no, that's that's really, really good. And you know, when you've got a powder charge of three or four grains down in there, a little bit of variation at the factory is gonna have a huge result, right, downrange? Yeah. It's, a, it's just a different problem domain. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a... Yeah, based on how high a volume that rimfire ammo is made, it is shocking how consistent it is. Yeah. Um, I attribute that to standardization over time. Hmm. So check it out. You know, we had not long ago in the grand scheme of things, a few years ago, the 17 HSM, seven other rim fires came out that are faster, you know, bottleneck rim fire little cartridges. And when they came out, I remember guys saying, oh, the 20, 22 rim fires finally over. <laughs> no, that stuff, I don't think you could win in a competition with those types of rim fires compared to these. These, this round has been being made for so many decades and it's mm -hmm. been refined so well that even though a superior design may come along, the manufacturability of it, this has been maturing for, what, nearly a hundred years. Mm -hmm. You bring out something brand new, it's gonna take a minute. Yeah, <laughs> It's yeah. gonna take a minute before it's up to par with what we've been doing forever. And that's how I look at this 22 long ranges. If you were to design something new today, it would probably be different. But this has got the benefit of all those decades of development and so that we can get them throwing powder charges that give you standard deviations 10 to 15 feet per second. It's when really we tested amazing. super long range, we were amazed at how well it shot and how tight the velocities were. Yeah. Really, really good stuff. Mm -hmm. Probably the best rimfire ammo that we've shot so far. 
Yeah, the Lapua stuff is extremely <laughs> consistent. Yeah, I like it. Well, you've really opened my mind to a lot of new uh, things to try and take into account, you know, the different factors and the considerations. I'm really interested to see where this all heads to. Yeah, me too. That's what's fun about science is like, when you do it the way, the way that I'm doing this, you don't know where it's gonna lead, you know? Um, I, I know some like directions, but in the end, it's just gonna, what I'm gonna do is publish papers. Eventually it'll be in a book and whoever can make use of it to make things better will. Mm -hmm. And will be one of them because our primary goal is to make the solver more accurate. Yeah. But anything, in order to learn that, you end up learning, you gotta learn a bunch of other stuff. And after learning all of it, I think that not just the predictability of it, but maybe we can improve on the actual performance of it too. Yeah, it's really, really good stuff. So yeah. if people wanna know more, yeah, if people want to know more, um, our work on this 22 stuff will be on the Science of Accuracy Academy. Um, and also just follow our social media. We'll keep you up on what we're doing there too. And if you click on that first link in the video description and go to the article for this video, I'll link to that stuff as well. Thank you, Brian. This has you been bet. super enlightening. Looking forward to sharing some results that I'll produce based on the factors that you've been talking about. And when your paper is published, I'll definitely take a look at that and, and just devour it. Cool, yeah, it is kind of a nerd topic, but <laughs> tell you what, man, the guys that figure it out yep. will have an advantage in, in the long range vertical aspect of it. Yep. You don't want to compete against a guy who knows it if you don't. Right. <laughs> so my question for you all is, what do you think? Have you experienced some of these factors and some of these phenomena? Drop a comment and let's start the discussion. That concludes this video, and that means it's time to wrap it up. I hope you enjoyed this video. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Also, we're on Facebook, YouTube, Rumble, where we've got unrestricted content, and Instagram. Make sure to follow us on all those channels. Ultimate Reloader also has a commercial solutions division serving law enforcement, the military, and the gun industry. We have some unique capabilities, including a comprehensive suite of recoil testing and evaluation capabilities, trigger profiling, and more. If you're interested in custom rifles like what we build here on the channel or gunsmithing services, you're going to want to go to rifles.ultimatereloader.com and get on the wait list. If you want to learn lucrative gunsmithing like what I show here on the channel, including building custom rifles and Cerakote plus a whole bunch more, you're going to want to check out the Colorado School of Trades, schooloftrades.edu. Thanks again for watching.